Bless the Lord for an anointed worship team. Amen, church. Praise the Lord. Take your copy of God's Word. We are um, in a a series uh, dealing with biblical doctrine, and uh, I want to, uh, this morning, complete what I launched into last week. Now, last week, uh, we, we took a very practical word under an unofficial title of the doctrine of the home. And uh, in, in dealing with the doctrine of the home, we unpack David's relationship to his son who's a, who is becoming the king. David is passing off the scene. Solomon, uh, who is most noted for his wisdom, though if you study his life, uh, there were some not so bright moments uh, in his life. The... Um, Today, uh, under the title, under the the series of believers, I want to talk to you about the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. It's it's a a little known and often ignored biblical truth that uh, is not necessarily welcomed in some evangelical circles, and here's why. It almost sounds arrogant. What what I'm going to share with you this morning is gloriously practical, but the practicality of it is that... When you came to Christ, now I'm not talking about when you walked an aisle, signed a card, and got in the baptistry. I'm talking about when you repented, when you said, I'm a sinner on my way to hell, and Jesus Christ stripped naked, laid bare, died on the cross for what I did in sin against the holy God, the moment that you, you under the leading of the Holy Spirit, confessed him, and you, he became your Savior and your Lord, you, you didn't just simply get out of hell you were enlisted at that moment to become part of an army, part of a priesthood, part of a kingdom that operates in a very practical way. Oftentimes, we view church as a Sunday situation that has no impact on our Monday living. That is simply not true. In fact, what I want you to do, I want, there's two passages. The, uh, let's go to Revelation 1 first. And I want to show you the biblical uh, precept for what we're going to look at under the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Look at Revelation. It's the last book in the New Testament if you're new to the things of faith or you're not familiar with the Word of God. Look at Revelation chapter 1, and I want you to fix your attention on verse 5. Now remember, the Lord showed us this from his Word back a couple of weeks ago. We dealt with... um, the biblical timeline. For example, do, if you want to know where this world is headed in its political system that ultimately will crescendo, it will act me with the arrival of the Antichrist, that's the book of Daniel. Daniel is so politically precise dealing with the Gentiles. Gentiles are those outside the covenant of, of both Israel and Yeshua Messiah, Christ. You and I are believers. We're Christians. We are not Jews redeemed for Israel. We are part of the bride and the body. We make up this mystical, incredible composition called the bride of Jesus Christ. If you want to know where the political system's headed, you read the book of Daniel. He's very explicit. What's going to rise out of the sea, the horns on the beast, um, all of that is predicted with incredible precision. If you want to know where, where, um, uh, for example, Israel's headed, In fact, to the point that that even those who profess Christ will look at you and say, that is too accurate, it cannot be true. Let let me give you an example just from this week. Because you never interpret the Bible through the headlines of of the news, you interpret the news through the Bible. Say amen. So let me me tell you, um, if you don't know this, one of my passions in life is studying biblical prophecy. And one of the uh, bigger criticisms I get is that there is a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel that says that the nation of Israel, as she exists today, because of the conflict, the controversy between uh, the sons of Esau. Now, we call them Palestinians, but there is no such thing as a Palestinian. It's, it's the sons of Esau. Uh, because of the war between them and the seed of Israel, which is back in the land, there's a biblical prophecy in the book of Ezekiel that says that the land of Israel will be divided in two places. It'll be divided. There's two sticks in the book of Ezekiel chapter 35 and going forward. Well, critics have uh, lampooned me, my, my whole teaching ministry, to say that is ridiculous. That, that is never going to happen. Well, guess what happened this week? The government of Israel failed. They, it has dissolved 
And it's only been in, you know, this current uh, government has only been uh, elected and operating a little more than a year. Now, because they failed, they're going to have to come back around for their fifth round of election in three years. And, and let me tell you what they're saying. Our president is getting ready to go to Israel and meet with the, with the interim president to divide the land. Well, hello, Goober. It was in the Bible. It was, it was in the text right there the whole time. They are actively pursuing what is called the two-road system where they're going to divide the land of Israel in such a way as to bring peace. Now, there will be no peace in Israel until the Prince of Peace comes back to Israel. Do you understand that? Now, why do you drag us through that? That Daniel with the political system of the world, Ezekiel with, with, with where Israel is headed, because if you want to know who we are and where we're headed, you go to the book of Revelation. And when you get to Revelation, it tells you who you are and you have to appropriate that. If you're born again and you know that you're saved, you celebrate that not only you're not going to hell, but you're going to heaven. Well, oftentimes in the Christian life, we rejoice that we're not going to hell and we're excited that we're going to heaven, but there's no practical expression, there's no application or appropriation of what Christ did at the cross and in the empty tomb. At the cross, I am forgiven. At the empty tomb, I am empowered. At the cross, the Son of God died for me, a sinner. At the empty tomb, the Holy Spirit that set him free from death is now living in me, and I can't die. <laughs> Amen. So the practical outlay is not just that I'm not going to hell. The practical reality is not that I I'm, I'm get to go to heaven. It is that today my salvation affects my current situation. So that's what we're going to look at. Look, look at Revelation chapter 1. Uh, and verse 6 and uh, verse 5, and then we're going to go back to 1 Kings chapter 2 in just a moment. Verse 5 from the sacred text. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Very important, listen carefully. And has made us fixed, final, done, in the annals of heaven, that is past tense, but it's active indicative, which means this. He made us in the past. He is making us currently, and we already are as if we were because of who he is. I can tell you're pumped about that. He has made us kings and priests. Uh, to, hit, to uh, his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, when I, uh, test time. It's test time because th this is a very practical word this morning. It, he has made us priests and kings. Priest is an act of intercession. King is an act of authority. Because I am a king in my king, I have the authority to intercede and ask for what he bought at the cross. I don't have in and of myself, I don't own the power, the intellect, the ability to go get what I need. This is why those of us who, who wrestle with our salvation, I'm saved, I'm not, I'm saved, I'm not, I'm in, I'm out, I'm, 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 I'm going to pray this prayer, maybe I'll get saved today. Listen to me. Let, me, let me say this to you, you need to get that settled. I, I'm not making light of that, you need to get that settled. But let me tell you why, even for those of us that once we get it settled, there's times when the enemy will creep in and he'll say, oh, you're not really saved. I mean, you're not really saved. Let me tell you why. Because if you ever appropriate the truth that us as sinners who deserve to go to hell, the Son of God came through the womb of a virgin, put on flesh and bone, walked in this world to purchase us from the penalty of sin, then got up on the third day as a priest, he died in my place. As a king, he's given me authority to live in the power that he's given me. So if the enemy can keep you waffling and double-minded and halting between two opinions, you're so worried about whether you are saved, not saved, I'm in, I'm out, I gotta get right, I gotta be more, you know, I gotta act better. Listen to me, you can't act good enough to get to heaven. If it's not the cross of Calvary, it's not the blood of the lamb, I'm telling you, your best 15 seconds in the world won't get you 15 foot in the gate of glory. I am a child of God by the grace of mercy of God. And when I go to the father in the bowl, in the boldness in the throne room to ask in my hour of need, I don't go based on my merit. It's not Jeffrey Thomas. It's Jesus triumphant in me. And I'm able to say with all authority, I am a priest of the most high God. I'm a king of the king that's coming. And that settles it in that moment. Now, that is theologically who I am in the priesthood. 
But how do I practically lay this out? Go to 1 Kings chapter 2. Uh, if you're still with me, say amen. I'm going to give you uh, four very practical truths. We looked at last week um, just as an application for dads. We looked at the fact that um, we, we don't have as much time as we thought. I love some of your reactions <laughs> from that illustration. It's definitely not one of your favorite. Uh, if you weren't here, you need to go back and listen to it. It'll bless you. Um, we, we don't have as much time as we think, and we got more influence than we thought. Now, I want to give you uh, four very practical truths out of 1 Kings chapter 2. David is preparing his son for a monumental position as a king. Now, how does this apply to us? First, uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 said, you are a king. Yeah. Do you understand that? You have authority. In you, now, to exercise that authority, you've got to live inside the truth of God's word. Look at verse 1 chapter 2. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore. Prove yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his way and to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word. Father, we pray no spirit but the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, nothing of me, nothing of we. I pray all of you that we might get something from your word illuminated by your spirit. For those who are watching through the miracle of the lens of that camera, we pray right now that God's distraction would melt away and that in a supernatural way, the Holy Spirit of God would rivet them, not to the preacher, but to the precepts of your word in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... So I, I want you to, if you would, for uh, a moment in your sanctified imagination, I, I, want, you to, I want you to imagine that you, you are about to become the king of, at this particular time, the single most influential military uh, uh, um, uh, ability. It's, 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 it, this nation is at its apex in some ways. David is passing off the scene. The 12 tribes have come together. And you are sitting there beside the king that is passing, and he's about to pass the mantle to you. Can you imagine the weight of that? Can you imagine millions of people looking to you for direction and protection and provision, and you're thinking, how in the world am I going to do this? One of the reasons that I circle back around to this passage is because of its practical application. We tend to treat Christianity as an ethereal, as, as something in, in the future eternally, but not immediately in the, in the practical. I'm telling you that the salvation we have is not just theolo theological language. It's a practical life that we live right now. Yeah. Say amen. Yeah. So this, this is what he's going to say to David. He's going to say David, uh, David's going to say to Solomon. He said, I, I want you to keep the charge of the Lord your God. Now, now this, is, this, is, this is what he's saying is this. You, you, you have been bought with a price. Even though this is pre-Calvary, you belong to the Lord your God. Therefore, you're not your own. So what you're going to do from this point on is under the leadership of the Lord and not the appetite of the flesh. Then he lays out the, the progress that's expected. He said, Walk in his ways. Now, I want you to do me a favor. In, in your own mind, I want you to go back and look at Ju June the 26th, 2021, and I want you to fast forward to June the 26th, 2022, and I want you to look at those 360-plus days, and I want to ask you a question. Do you know him more intimately today than you did this time last year? Or is, there, is there something about him in intimacy is there an awareness? Are you walking in a place this time this year that you had not even dreamed of last year? Because that's what he means when he says, walk in his way. It's a progressive. I, in my salvation, it's settled. I am sealed, seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. But there is this beautiful doctrine of sanctification where that the salvation that delivered me is now developing me. I'm going to say it again because only one got it. it, it <laughs> salvation delivered me. Who did it deliver me from? From myself. It delivered me from me. See, we, we're so quick to blame this stuff on the devil. Boy, preacher, I'll tell you, the devil made me do it. Well, 
wait a minute. Now, he might have helped you, <laughs> but he found enough of you in you to do what he wanted to do in you. Do you understand that? So, and I'm, I'm going to give you this real quick. This is, this is parenthetical. This is a side note, but this so move, you know, as much as I study prophecy, I had an epiphany back a few weeks ago. I saw something I've never seen, which is what happens when you go to the word of God. You'll get what you never got if you'll go where you've never been. So I was in the word of God and I was studying the millennial kingdom because that's where I'm going to live. How many of you are going on summer vacation? How many are going on summer vacation? Raise your hand. You're going on summer vacation. $52 a gallon. You're going on summer vacation. I, if Christy said to me, we, we, I want to go to this place on the coast, I would study it before I go. Because if I'm going to spend a week there, I want to know what's there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, if I'm going to spend eternity somewhere, I won't get to know it. And it excites me, especially when I look around this world and it's doing what it's doing. So I was studying the millennial kingdom. And in the millennial kingdom, there's this odd thing that happens. The millennial kingdom is at 1,000 years where the bride of Christ, the church, rules and reigns with Christ who uh, brings Eden back to earth, brings the Garden of Eden back to earth. And in that period, now I don't have time to explain all of this, but there will be humans living on earth that will birth children and those children will live to be eight or 900 years old. Now, I'm not talking about allegorical. I'm talking about literal, literal. That, they'll live that long. For a thousand years, Jesus Christ will rule and reign and it will be quite literally heaven on earth. Well, there's the oddest thing that happens. It, at the end of that thousand years, those who were born in the millennial kingdom, Isaiah 66 says that if they die at 120 years of age, they die as a youth. Okay, I just had a birthday, and there ain't nothing youth about your 50s. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can't imagine at 100 plus years old. You, anyway, it, it, so here's, my, here's, the, here's the epiphany. It, it, I'm looking at this millennial. Now, Jesus is physically in his, in his resurrection body ruling. There is, there is, there's no politics. Woo! There's no, there's no Congress. Woo! There's no IRS. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Woo! That's the most excited y'all been all morning. In fact, there's, now I don't mean this in a bad way. My son-in-law's here and I want, there's no lawyers. Now, I love him. <laughs> But there's no lawyers. Let me tell you how I know that. Because the Bible says he will adjudicate it immediately. There ain't going to be any arguing. You're not going to get the ACLU to get you out of it. You, you, you're not going to get a lawyer uh, to, 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 you know, stay. The, Jesus in that moment will say, that's right, that's wrong, you're done, out. That's the way it's going to go. I like black and white. Can I get a witness up in the house? Well, here's the thing. At the end of that thousand years of living, effectively, uh, heaven on earth, the church riding around in her glorified bodies. I... What's a glorified body? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, I do think we're going to be about five foot six. Now, that's my personal opinion. But, and I can prove that from the word of God. But that's none of your business. At the end of this, those who have been born in the millennial kingdom, they physically see him. They've beheld him. They've seen us going back and forth from the new Jerusalem, which is, which is the satellite city. It's the, it's, the, it's the bride chamber for the bridegroom of the church. We're traveling back and forth at a speed of light, ministering the mercies of God. And at the end of that, they rally and say, we don't want any more of this. We don't want Jesus over us anymore. And do you know, for the first time it dawned on me, if you look at the millennial kingdom, the devil has been chained. He's, he's not even on the scene. He's chained. So who made those people rebel against God? The heart does. It is wicked. It is deceitful. And I'm telling you, without the Holy Ghost of God renewing our hearts and minds, we'd rebel in a skinny minute. How can you live a thousand years looking at the very one that was slain from the foundations of the earth, pierced asunder for our sins, rose from the dead in all authority, power, and glory? How can you watch people zooming at the speed of light back and forth to the satellite city? Children are playing it with, with, with rattlesnakes. The lines laid down with the lamb. There is no global warming. Y'all know it is so hot. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, baby. It is so hot <laughs> that the chickens are laying boiled eggs. That's how hot it is. <laughs> now, now we got, we, got, we, we got, here's my point. You and I, as priests and kings, 
There is a practical application. We blame stuff on the devil that he had nothing to do with. It's our wicked hearts. And because we don't appropriate the word of God to say, listen, I didn't just get saved from hell and I didn't just get saved to heaven. There is right now in this moment, there is the appropriation of the death of the cross, the resurrection of the tomb, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and I am no longer a victim, I'm a victor. I'm no longer living under condemnation, but deliverance through the cross of the Lamb. And, and, and how do you apply that as a king? That's exactly what David says. Let's say it very quickly. Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you're not taking notes, guess what I want? I want you to write it down. All right, we're going to take the text apart just like we should because the text is the authority. Now, here, look at verse 3. He, this is what he says. He says, I want you to walk in his ways and keep his statutes. Now, stop right there. Keep his statutes. This is a word of invitation. That word statutes is also used multiple times throughout the word of God to invite people to come into his audience on, on the high holy days. There are seven feasts, four in the spring, three in the fall. These are prophetic pictures. Not only are they practical in that, we, that they went in to be with the Father. For example, Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Passover. Passover is a picture of our salvation, the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundations of the earth. So when we celebrate Easter here, we're really celebrating Passover, which is a picture of our deliverance through the blood of the Lamb. So when this word statutes is used, it's quite literally an invitation. So that, let me give an example. In the mid-1300s, there was a black plague that broke out that ravaged to the tune of millions of deaths in Europe. Now, in the 1300s during the Black Plague, the bubonic plague, there was an anomaly. There was something very odd about that. Millions were dying from an unknown sickness, a plague, but no Jew was dying. The Jewish community, by and large, was seemingly unaffected. They didn't contract it. They didn't die from it. They didn't manifest the symptoms of it. So guess what, guess what, guess what, guess what the good European Christians said? They said, them nasty hook-nosed Jews have made a pact with the devil, and they've caused this plague to come on to us because we believe in the Christ. They crucified the Christ, and they started killing Jews because the Jews didn't get the black plague. Now, if you study, the Jews were living by Levitical statute, and it simply said something like this. It said you ought to live sanitary. Yeah. The Europeans, uh, I don't know if y'all know what a slop jar is. Okay, just repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus, for indoor plumbing. I, I live just on the cusp of my great-grandparents. Uh, they didn't have running water the first years of my life. They had an outhouse, and they had a slop jar. And for those of you who romance the days, you know, I'd like to go back to the old days. You can have them. I like mine bolted to the floor. Can I get a witness in the house? I was with Aunt Dot this week. Got to spend some time with her, and we were talking about the old days and the house that, that she grew up in, most of them were born in, and the fact that, you know, that they didn't even have running water. And um, I remember when they put the bathroom in. Uh, up till then, they had an outhouse up on the hill, which I was never allowed to use because I was, I was kind of small. <laughs> And they would say to me, if you go in there, you fall in, we'll never get you out. So I had to use what was called a slop jar. Let us thank God for toilets. I asked Aunt Dot, I did peek in the outhouse when I was a kid just to see what it looked like because I was, I was curious about it why they wouldn't let me go in there. And I asked Aunt Dot this week, is a two-seater? <laughs> think about it. Now, listen, ladies, I know y'all like to go to the bathroom together, but I'm just going to tell you, that's a little much right there. I'm just going to be honest with you. They lived under a statute. Literally, 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 this is what the Spirit will do. He will reveal something to you, and he will invite you, even though it's Old Testament. There are precepts and principles in, in the Torah, in the law, to protect us. There's times when the Spirit of God will move into our life, and by statute, 
He will reveal something to us that if you let the law of religion tell you that it's not appropriated anymore, you will miss the deeper spiritual meaning. There, there are times when the Holy Spirit of God will invite you to come in by precept and principle to operate by protection, and you won't even understand it. Let me give you an example. This week, to God's glory, the Supreme Court finally came to their sanity and understood it is not in the Constitution it is not a constitutional right to kill an unborn child. Do, do you understand that? Praise God and the Lamb. There are children that will not be killed this week because multiple states have said no more taking what, what is what's called a child and making a choice. No more. Listen to me. The church has never had a greater invitation from the Spirit of God than right now to respond. We've marched, we've cried, we've prayed, we've begged. Now it's time to rise up to the occasion and say we would like to invade the community with the children that are not wanted and are not going to be aborted. Let the church of the living God rise up and say we have an altar alternative, bring them to us. An invitation is also, it, it, you got to get a hold of this. You got to get a hold of this and I got to move quick. And, and the statute, it's literally an invitation to come into his protection, but it's timed. It, it's time sensitive. Let me give an example. There will be times when the Holy Spirit of God out of your private praise and prayer time will reveal something to you in such a way that you know it is a divine invitation at that moment. God's speaking to you to operate in a way, come, come be with me, come be with me, I'm gonna do something. It's time sensitive. You can reject it, but, it, but, but in that moment, in that moment, let, let me give an example if I could use just as recent as last week. I, I got to this first point last week and the Holy Spirit said, that's it, stop. I got the invitation and I stopped and I just, I just, I didn't make a show of it. You might not have even known it. The Holy Spirit said, that's it. That's all I want right there. When I got to the last point and I said, there's a statute, which is literally the word invitation. The, the spirit is beckoning, calling, wooing, saying, I'm going to do something. I'd like for you to be involved in it. I stopped at that moment. In the invitation, completely un, un, unknown to me, I had no clue because you don't know what's happening in this room. You have no clue what, what the Holy Spirit's doing. There was a lady who's been grappling with her salvation. She's been halting between two opinions. And in the moment that I said, the moment that I said, the Spirit of God's extending an invitation, in that moment, the Holy Spirit said to her, this is your invitation. This is your moment. And she got gloriously saved. And what, what is made of brick and mortar and carpet and paint turned into a birthing chamber. And she stepped from death to life in that moment because the Holy, listen, now you telling me, preacher, if you hadn't stopped, she wouldn't have got saved. No, I'm telling you, had I decided to not yield to the statute, the invitation of the Spirit, I would have missed what God was doing. She'd still gotten saved. The Spirit was still moving, but because I want to do it Jeffrey's way instead of Jesus's way, I'd have missed the whole thing. Yeah. There are times when the Holy Spirit will say, I'm inviting you to step into this. And if you'll yield to him, I'm telling you, that, now what's the practical outlay? The, the statute is the invitation. Then, then he says it this way. He says, keep his statutes and his commandments. Now, where the statute is a word of invitation, his commandments are a word of protection. So I've moved from the statutes, which teach me how to live practically. It teaches me what to eat, what not to eat. It teaches me how to live in such a manner that I'm a blessing to my neighbor and, 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 and not a burden to my neighbor. It teaches me how to adjudicate things in my life and what's right and what's wrong and what's righteous and what's unrighteous. That's an invitation to walk with him. His commandments are protection to keep me from things that the enemy would use to harm me. We tend to view the commandments of God as, as punitive instead of protective. Now, let me give you an example very quickly. When God says, thou shalt not... He's not keeping you from something. He's keeping you for something. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I, it's going to get a little uncomfortable in here. So, warning. It's going to get a little uncomfortable for just a minute. It's going to get as tight as Lulu Roman's girdle. So, just suck it up, buttercup, and we'll get through it. Amen? Yeah. Y'all don't know who Lulu Roman is, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> when God says that he preserves intimacy between a man and a woman for after marriage, it is not because he's trying to keep you from the pleasure of intimacy. It's that he's trying to keep you for the spiritual, physical depth of intimacy. Yeah. He, he's not trying to keep you from it. He's trying to keep you for it. Yeah. You understand that? 
Uh, when, when I was reminded this week, uh, while we were back home in West Tennessee, um, I, we were doing some ministry, which is just who we are. And we had gone to a home uh, with a young lady that I actually had the privilege to lead to the Lord. Um, and I remember when her mother first came to the church that we pastored there for 12 years. We were in one of those movements of God. It just, it just was one of those seasons where God was rending uh, the heavens and the oil was flowing and the winds were blowing. And so much so that we had to put a tent out beside the church to accommodate the crowds for the particular revival that we were in. This lady, uh, in the midst of that, uh, uh, born again with a little bitty girl. I, I don't know how old she was. She was just, just, just a, a, a young thing. Um, she joined the church, professed Christ, joined the church. So I'm a believer. Came from one of the largest Baptist churches in the area, wanted to be in on what God was doing. A few weeks after that, it came to my attention privately. Somebody said to me, Preacher, you do know that she's living with the, the baby daddy, but they're not married. I want you to listen closely to what I'm about to say because you could misconstrue what I'm about to say to you. I, I wasn't aware of that. She'd already joined the church. Some, some churches use church discipline to wound, to hurt, to embarrass. That, that is not the word of God. The word of God's never punitive. It's always restorative. It's never to embarrass. It's always to bring back. You understand that? So I, I, um, I happened to know the man that she was living with, and I knew, I knew of him, and I knew that he did not care for me. You're shocked. I can tell you're shocked. But I had, a, I, had a, I, had, I had a responsibility as her pastor. So I got a deacon, and we went to the home, and I sat down, and I called her by name with her little toddler girl uh, walking around in the room, and I said, I want you to know something. We love you, and we're not going to embarrass you. I'm not, I'm not here as, as God's policeman, but there is a commandment in the Word of God that if you are not married to him, you should not be living with him. And on top of that, he's not a believer. And on top of that, you're paying all the bills. And I'm not even going to tell you what the Bible calls him, infidel. Anyway, <laughs> this dude's mad. I mean, he's seven kinds of mad. So I say to the deacon, you need to go over and sit down. Right by him, between me and him, you need to sit down. That's why we test them for a season. You understand what I'm saying? If you've been nominated, if you live long enough to be ordained. I mean, we've had several ordained, but they died in the middle of it. So anyway. So... This, listen to what she said to me. Now, she, she, wasn't, she, she wasn't angry. Now, he was, and he wanted me out of the house. But I'm telling you something, not in arrogance, not, not, in, not in cockiness, but I'm just telling you, as a shepherd, you mess with my sheep. And two things you better not mess with. You better not mess with my family, and you better not mess with my forever family because I can backslide for 30 seconds and kick you in the kneecaps. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> he wanted me out of that house, and I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. She, you, 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 you are living in this house, you're not born again. She's born again. She looked at me. This is what she said. She said, I want to ask you something. How is it that I've been a member of one of the largest churches in this area for 20-something years, and I've been living with him for, for, for a long time, and nobody's ever said this to me? Well, I can't answer that. Yeah. I don't know. But I can tell you that it's in this book, and this book says that you are a daughter of the Most High. And you ought to be treated like the princess that the prince of peace died for you to be. And I'm just simply saying to you, you cannot live in this. You are, the heavens will close up the favor of God over this little girl's life, over your life. It is not that God in heaven is, is angry with you. It's that he has something for you. And the protection of the commandment is not because he doesn't want you to be happy. It's because in holiness, you get something that money can't buy, the devil can't steal, the world can't explain. She said, preacher, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about it. Well, make a long story short, I want you to know in the midst of another revival, she came down a sawdust trail under that tent. She repented, came back to God. We sent some deacons to that house to pack him up. <laughs> I sat in the home this week with that daughter who's now in her 20s. An accomplished medical, she's, she's an accomplished nurse. God healed her two years ago. We got to be in the room when he did it through the anointing of James chapter 5, the precept of James 5. God anointed, we anointed, God healed her from an aggressive cancer. And now she's found a man that loves her. He's born again. And I could not help but, but sit in wonder and watch this, 
this grown little, this woman who was a little toddler dancing around the feet of her mother, living outside the favor and protection of God. And because that mama said, I'd rather, I'd rather have God's protection than a man's presence. I'm, listen, she has a phenomenal job. She's got a daughter that's accomplished that God healed from cancer. And now she's marrying a young man that loves Jesus. I, I, I said something to him about anointing their new home and dedicating to the Lord. He said, preacher, we've already anointed it three times. <laughs> Listen to me. When God gives you a statute, an invitation to join him, and a commandment of protection in order to, listen, he's not keeping you from it. He's keeping you for it. Now, 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 we're almost done. We're almost done. Y'all already on Tazlon, see it in your eyes. You're already riding the Ferris wheel, eating hot dogs. I can see it. But when he says statutes, that's an invitation to join him. When he says commandments, that's protection uh, uh, quite literally, it's the mizvah. It's, it's, the, it's what he says, no trespassing. Now, here's a hard word. Watch this. Watch this. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments. That, that word, uh, if, if, if statutes is an invitation and commandments is protection, then judgment is correction. Yeah. Now, we don't like this in the evangelical American church. We like it. We like it. Kumbaya, fluffy, feel good. We don't like correction. But I want you to hear me. Listen carefully. If you can live in unbroken, unrepentant, arrogant sin and never, ever feel the convicting, correcting hand of your father, you are of illegitimate birth. And I'm telling you, there are people that sit in churches all week long and with a smug smile on their face, they'll say, I'll tell old Jeffrey Thomas is missing it. I, I come here every week and I'm living any way I want. I run with whoever I want. I go with every woman I want. I do everything that I want to do. And I've never had God ever one time correct me, discipline me, light me up. I'm going to tell you something. That's because you are illegitimate birth. You are not truly born again. You walk down an aisle, you prayed a prayer, you signed a card, you got in a baptistry, but the truth of the matter is the prayer you prayed didn't change the life you live and it's not going to change where you're going and there is a reason you've never had the heavenly father light your britches up because you don't have a heavenly father you are the father of lies and you've been deceived Uh, thank God for invitations by his statutes thank God for protection under his commandments but there are judgments when the Holy Ghost will sit down and say I I need to correct this now when I was when I was uh, still living at home I think it's about, about late elementary, early middle school. Um, this is back when uh, you still got a report card. Boy, I'm going to tell y'all something. Y'all, I'm ashamed to say this, but I thank the Lord I didn't grow up when they emailed them grades to the house. <laughs> Come on, Ray Ray, don't make me call you out. I mean, you got a card. You got a card. You got, you got an envelope and you pulled a card out. And I'm just going to tell y'all I'm ashamed to say this, but you could turn an F into a B. Let's all repent right now. Let's just repent. So I get my, I get my, I, I walk back and forth to school, uphill both ways, no shoes. Anyway, and it, I, so on the way home, I'd take that out and I, I would, I, I, and I had a lot of F's to turn into B's. I couldn't do anything with the D's. <laughs> I'd turn them in, and about the, about the second or third report card uh, that I was bringing home, my teacher evidently caught on to something. <laughs> And uh, so she called ahead, and she said, I just need y'all to know he's not doing as good as you think he is. In fact, all those B's are F's. Well, when I got to the house, my dad was standing in the door waiting on me. Somebody see that card. <laughs> well, my dad declared that afternoon, he said, uh, my dad worked shifts. Um, you know, he'd work sometimes four to midnight, sometimes midnight to seven, and seven to whatever. My dad said that day, he said, uh, when do you get another report card? I said, well, it'll be six weeks, six weeks. He said, every day without exception, seven days a week, I don't care where we are, what we're doing, or when I get home, every day without exception, you're going to meet me in the living room. Now, the living room, for those of you who don't know this, was the Holy of Holies. It had green shag carpet with sprinkles of yellow. If a small child fell in it, they would disappear. It was thick. (laughs) You didn't vacuum it, you raked it. You raked the carpet. Inside that holy of holies, all the furniture had the plastic still on it, still on it. You were not allowed to go in there. And in fact, the way my mother raked it, if you walked through there, she would get you. She'd see their footprints right there. Look at that. My dad said, we're going to meet in the living room. 
And every day without exception, that sometimes it, when my dad would get off at midnight, he'd get home by one in the morning, he would wake me up, bring me to the living room, and we would do what was called the whipping dance. <laughs> this side had time out. Let me talk to some knockouts. Anybody in here with a knockout? My dad would take me in the living room, he'd take his belt off, and, and he would proceed to whip me every day for six weeks. About a week and a half into this, we were doing the whipping dance. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but my dad would grab me. He was a big man. My dad's a tall, big guy, and he would grab me, and I would pull away, and we would do the whipping. We would hop and hit and hop and hit and hop and hit, hop and hit, and I would pull as far away as I could. My dad would get back, just get a good, good like a horse whip, buddy, and pow, and I'd have these little hickeys all up and down my legs. And about a week and a half into that, we were hitting and hopping and doing the dance, and it, I hopped uh, on an off hit, and I broke our rhythm, and when I fell, I fell back into my dad, and because I was really small then, I, I grabbed my dad's leg. Well, my dad, when he commits to the whipping dance, he is, nothing's going to break his stride. You understand what I'm saying? He is committed to the beating. And he didn't even stop. He just, so we just started whipping like this. We just, we did the whooping dance like this. And I'm holding on with all I got. And we just go around for a while. What I, what, what I noticed when we got through with that particular ceremony <laughs> was that I didn't have near the hickeys. I didn't, I didn't have the end of the belt. But because what had happened was while I was trying to get away, he had all the momentum to pop me. So the next day, it dawned on me, it doesn't hurt near as bad when I'm close to him. So I kind of got down. <laughs> and when he pulled that belt off, I ran, got a hold of that leg. And for the rest of the six weeks, we just did the whoop and dance. <laughs> Do you know what? It didn't hurt near as bad the closer I got to him. Take some of y'all, it takes some of y'all an hour and a half to watch 60 minutes, I swear. Do, do, do you get what I'm saying to you? He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to protect you. Those rules in there are not prohibitive in a punitive sense. They're protective. The reason that he gives you an invitation, the reason that he gives you protection is so that in that moment he can give you a word of correction. And if I've responded to the invitation and I've lived under the protection of his word, there are times when I say, Father, hit me again. Now, let me tell you the worst thing that happened to a believer is not that they feel the chastening hand of God, but they cease to feel the hand of God. I'm telling you, listen, it didn't seem pleasant at the time, but there are times when I have looked into the face of my heavenly father and said, Father, I just want to thank you that I feel you in my rebellion. You didn't, you didn't reject me in my, in my sinfulness. You didn't forsake me. I thank you that we went to the woodshed and I have no doubt. In fact, my spiritual behind can prove I belong to the Father. You lit me up. Glory to God, you didn't take your hand off of me. You loved me enough to bring me back. Why is that? Because a statute is an invitation to join him. A commandment is protection when I'm walking with him. Correction is to keep me from being beguiled by the flesh, the devil, or the world. Now watch this last one. We're done. Watch this last one. We're done right here. He said that you may, well, let me read it. I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. Let me, let me, let me read it. He, it, it. We were talking about his testimonies. I want to read the text because I, I don't want to come off as the authority. He said keep his statutes. That's the invitation. His commandments, that's protection. His judgments, that's the correction. And his testimonies, that's the revelation. Now, why is revelation important? Because the word of God is so supernatural that when it's wed to the spirit of God, it's, it can, if you ever read a passage you've read a thousand times and seen something you've never seen, the 1,001, you ever done that? You think, holy hallelujah, how did, how did I miss that? Because I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to receive it. Can I, can I illustrate this for you? If you are not willing to walk in the invitation and the intimacy with the Father, hey, Jeff, I got a statute, and here's the statute. This is what I want you to do. If you'll trust me with 10% of your income, I will do with 90% what you couldn't do if you had 200% of it. Now, I'm just telling you. I can't, I, I, that makes no sense on paper. But I have lived, Christy and I have lived that reality our whole marriage. Here's a commandment. Jeff, if you keep this commandment, it's, 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 it's not that I'm keeping you from something. It's that I'm keeping you for something, and you won't be, be pierced asunder with many sorrows. 
And when you do stray, I'm going to pass judgment. I'm going to correct. I'm going to bring you home. So that when you have in the invitation and through the, the, the protection and in correction, I'm going to give you a word of revelation. Now, how does that work practically as a priest, as a king? Can I illustrate this and we'll go home? Okay, I'll preach enough. <laughs> Can I illustrate this and we'll go home? Back a few weeks ago, uh, I was in my private praise and prayer time. And uh, I was looking at my summer preaching schedule for, for the Fairview Knox. And, you know, we committed uh, June to doctrine. And we're a little off course, but welcome to Fairview. And uh, we, we didn't quite get, I'm not through with the doctrine of hell and the doctrine of heaven. I'm going to preach on the doctrine of hell at Taswell this afternoon because uh, it'll be 11,000 degrees. <laughs> and it, uh, but I, so I'm praying through my preaching schedule. And, and the Holy Spirit in my private praise and prayer time that morning said, very, I just this deep impression in my heart. You, you need to pick up the doctrinal series after July. And I thought, well, why? So I lingered for a few more minutes, and I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord to give me some clarity, and, and the Lord impressed deeply into my spirit. Uh, July, you need to preach on faith. You, you need to preach on the biblical doctrine of faith and just share how the, the Word of God through Manly Beasley and Bill Stafford and Bertha Smith how it's impacted your life and how living in faith has, has allowed you to see some testimonies you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Y'all ever talk to the Lord and say something like this? Um, now, Lord, <laughs> I don't know if you've thought about this. <laughs> Y'all ever say that? I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I, I don't know if you really thought about this, <laughs> but this July, and the Lord said, I want you to preach on faith through July. And then on the fifth Sunday of July, I want you to have church all day. Now, that doesn't mean all day. That means Sunday morning, Sunday night. I, and we're going to take, I want you to lead Fairview to believe me for a faith offering. Not, not a tithe offering, but above and beyond the tithe. I want you to say to them, because you put, you, you, I put it in your heart, in Fairview's heart, Renew 22. And I don't have time to unpack that, but Renew 22 is a big part of our vision this year. Well, there's a spiritual component that we're already seeing. We have a children's pastor because of Renew 22, not because of the prowess of your preacher or the organization of your church. It's because God sent us a children's pastor out of Renew 22. Now, part of that Renew is a physical component. We, we've, we've got some serious repairs to do on, on the property to keep it stellar and operating. We've got a parking lot that is in dire need of attention. And I said to the Holy Ghost, I said, now, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you thought about this. But July is historically the, 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 the month of giving is the lowest. They're going on vacation. That's wonderful. But while they're on vacation, gas is now $52 a gallon, and a loaf of bread costs a small child. So I don't know if you know this or not, but July is really not the time. <laughs> Y'all never done that? Okay. All right. All right. I knew he was going to do this. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. I have decided to tithe 20%. Oh, what's the problem? Oh, 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 there's a problem? Oh, yeah, it's okay when it's on me. <laughs> but when it's on you, I said to the Holy Ghost, you've got to be kidding me. July, I'm, number one, it's hot. Number two, they are playing rotate the Baptist. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they, it's historically our lowest giving month. And you want me to believe you for an offering in the fifth Sunday of July, just to, just to fix the parking lots, $150,000. Just the parking lots, $150,000. We're building back better. <laughs> Why? Why? So I come out of my private praise and prayer time the Monday morning wrestling with God who has said to me definitively, I have an invitation for you. I want you to believe me in the least likely month of the year when there's the most distraction, and I don't say that to anybody's condemnation. It's just the truth of the matter. I've got an invitation for you to join me, and if you'll believe me in this, I will give you a testimony. I will give you a word of revelation, and I need you to believe me. Now, I wish I could tell you that I mustered up the faith of a Corey Ten Boom, that I walked in the high places with Bertha Smith, but on my way to the office that morning, I, I did not have the faith 
I did not say, you know, God, we're really going to do this. In fact, the Holy Spirit of God said to me when I came out of my private praise and prayer time to come to the office, you need to tell your wife. Now, here's the problem. When you tell somebody you are accountable, and especially if it's the other half of you. And I said to the Lord, shouldn't we pray about this a while? <laughs> and the Holy Ghost said, you, you can either tell her or I'll do it another way. So I walked up, not with the joy of the Lord. I said, Duh, you ain't going to believe what God's going to make me do. <laughs> That's how I said it. We're going to preach on faith in July. Fifth Sunday of July, we're going to take a miracle offering. We're going to believe God for above and beyond the tithe. We're going to believe God for a renewed 22. I come to the office Monday morning. Now, I have permission to tell this. People get lost in this because they hear the money and they miss the point. God owns the gold and the silver. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills on, uh, that the cattle stand on. I walk into the office. I'm still being corrected in my spirit, wondering, did I really hear from God? I walk into my office. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, Monday's is my executive pastor day. I'm doing business, getting stuff done, getting stuff done. My phone rings, and, and, a, and a covenant member of this church says, hey, I need you to, I need you to uh, come over to the business. And I said, well, uh, what, what do you need? He said, well, I'll, I'll tell you when you get here. I, I, got, I got something for you. So I get in my truck. I drive to West Knoxville. I walk into his office. He's brought all of his uh, employees in, vice presidents, all them. They're all in the room. And he said, um, hey, Jeff, I got to tell you something. Um, he said, strangest thing. He said, I, you know, yesterday morning, yesterday morning, the Holy Spirit really put it on my heart. He was not even in the building. He wasn't even here. He's watching through the camera. He said, the strangest thing, yesterday morning, the Holy Spirit told me that he wanted me to give you a check that you, you believe in God for money. I said, really? He said, yeah, here's a check for $100,000. I'm sorry, is this on? Is this on? Here's a check for $100,000. And, and you just, you know where God wants it, so I need you to just put it where God wants it. That's called Renew 22. And, and listen to me. Would God have done it? God already done it in his heart. God had already completed it in his heart. Do you understand that? It's whether or not Jeffrey Thomas wanted to get in on what God was doing. Am I willing to receive the invitation of the impossible? Am I willing to walk in the commandment of his protection? Will I allow him to correct me and step out and not be able to put it on paper, put it in a calculator? It makes no sense that in a downturn economic recession that a businessman would hand us a check to say, here's $100,000 that the Holy Spirit told me to give to the church let me explain something to you he was going to give it regardless but had I not received what God was doing in my life I'd have missed the opportunity to say God you know better than Jeff Amen. are you with me yes. do you know how many times God is calling us as a priest and a king to walk in intercession and authority, but because we won't let him protect us or correct us, he cannot reveal to us. Because if he can't trust you to keep the word you know, he will never trust us with the things we don't know yet. So there's a hundred and something thousand dollars plus in Renew 22. Now that doesn't solve all the problems. It's interesting he didn't pay at all. I wonder why. Yeah. Look at your neighbor. <laughs> Boy, it's good preaching until it gets right in the person in your britches, isn't it? it? Listen to me. Your father in heaven did not die just to get you out of hell. He died to fill you full of heaven while you were walking on this earth. So much so that if you'll just apply these four simple principles as a priest and a king, you'll see things I have not seen, ear hath not heard, but the Holy Spirit hath revealed in these last days. Yeah.